Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to our dear listeners around the world. And we have many of them, actually, don't we, Dirk? Hello, Dirk, how are you? Good generic time of the day, Sebastian. What time is it really for you at this very moment? 9.20 p.m., exactly. You look like 3 a.m. to me. (laughs) (laughs) Because of how how tired I look or because of uh, what you think may be a pajama, but is actually a traditional Indonesian dress, uh, men's dress, which is tailored to me. It's given to me by a friend, a close friend of mine in Jakarta. Um, He had it made, uh, tailor-made to me. And it's called batik, which is a uh, typical Indonesian wow. motif. Like it's a repeated motif. It looks like a pyjama. Uh, in the Indonesian context, in Indonesia, it's fine. <laughs> it doesn't look like a pyjama, but I know it may look a little so, bit odd so you're saying, uh, on this video recording. You're saying if I visit Indonesia, a country where I've never been, um, to me it will look like people walk on the streets in pyjamas. Is that what you're saying? I'm 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 just noticing how I look like on this video conference call. Uh, it didn't occur to me that I could look like I'm wearing pajama, but because it's late, <laughs> I was wondering if you were thinking that. But but it is true. It is very striking um, in in the streets of Indonesia and and Jakarta in particular, where you have a number of people wearing this kind of repeated modi- motif on your shirt, uh, whether it's short sleeve or long long sleeve shirt like like this. It actually looks looks pretty cool, actually, and it's it's quite colorful. Mine is is a, a dark green, so it's not exactly the most colorful one. But but it's funny how how men would. It's only men wearing this kind of like um, button shirt mm-hmm. uh, with batik motif. I think for women they would have other kind of of uh, dresses. I'm not very familiar. Not can't imagine right now. But I most certainly there must be. But it's quite colorful. It's cheerful. Like a lot of people in I guess in Western Europe or the US, they wear like black or gray or maybe occasionally white or beige, but it's it's not that common for people to wear like, you know, blue or green or red. It, it, it is actually quite nice to see. And I think also in, uh, in, uh, in big companies, they tend to, like if you're a senior ranking official in the, or an executive in the, in the company, you would you'd be wearing this like for traditional or important meetings, uh, more, more so than maybe a, a business suit like in the Western world. I can tell you, you don't so, look like wearing a um, pyjama. So I'm, I can assure okay. you. looks actually good, but I only see a very small part of it anyway. So uh, uh, You don't want to see the rest because I'm not wearing anything below. I'm, I'm just wearing this <laughs> and, and, out of courtesy. <laughs> you already... <laughs> oh my God, you, you can't believe what I... What, what you've heard so wow. so if you if we take a picture of this would that be one of the content pieces you would hope to inevitably be deleted wow you're getting good at this yes, yes absolutely <laughs> this content should be self-destructing <laughs> you're good at this wow what a i can see that for you it's 3 23 p.m <laughs> i can tell yep. Yep. Um, so f- that's why I give you the courtesy of doing the transition for you, but you can enlighten me with whatever you prepared as a transition. <laughs> oh, I had nothing better than that. I did not even think about a transition yet. I was wondering where you were getting at. You turned around, you looked, faced the wall because you cannot believe I was actually half naked, the wrong side this time. Uh, <laughs> you're turning around again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not showing you anything. What are you? What are you talking about? No, come on. That's why I'm like I'm even like keeping my my beautiful Indonesian costume uh, on me. All right. So the motion today is disappearing content, self-destructing content is inevitable to ensure privacy. So what are we talking about? Uh, these are the things like Snapchat, like if I'm not mistaken, because I don't use it, Instagram Stories. So both of these are examples, among others, of content which disappears after a set time. It is in a self-destructing mode. So this is what we're going to talk about today, whether it's the one of the only ways to ensure privacy or not. And the flip of the coin, as usual, has decided who will be for and against. And in this case, Dirk, you will start the debate and you will be against the motion. And I'll be for, and I will speak after you. So whenever you're ready. All right. Cool, cool. And not even on Snapchat. 
And an Instagram, Have you tried did it? you ever did you ever send an Instagram a message that self destructed um, or disappeared? Because no, uh, but I was referring to the stories, right? Yeah, Instagram yeah, yeah. Stories, did you ever do a story and they... on Instagram? No, because I'm I'm actually not even I'm not even following stories, but I I, I use Instagram just to flip through photos, and I wonder what all the other junk is about. <laughs> no, I've I've not used. It. I've 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 seen the stories from people. Yeah. But but that's why I know it exists. But I haven't used it myself. I'm not a very. I don't use Instagram. I have a few things, but it's old stuff mm -hmm. and very few pieces. And Snapchat, I tried once because when we were talking about it a few years ago when it came out, and then I was horrified at the look and feel of it. I thought it was it was a joke because it looked really really not serious. So I I just tried it, but like literally for a few minutes, and then un uninstalled it because I really didn't relate to it. Yeah, and I'm actually personally uh, completely on the other side. I'm actually obsessed with keeping all the content I create, all my messages, everything. If anything, not because they're useful or newsworthy or anything, but but it's I think two things. I think one, it terrifies me to imagine that content could disappear. It's like a piece of me which is gone. Um, may sound extreme, but this is how I feel. It's a bit like. You know, the passing of time. And the second thing is I want to use all this data at some point to run a machine learning model on it. Um, so there's millions of words I have written in my emails or in Google Documents, personal ones, and I'm thinking I want to train a model. The thing is this data is not properly labeled and categorized, so I can't really train a model on it. I have a few ideas on how to do this, and I've seen a number of examples, uh, but I'd love to replicate myself mm -hmm. um, and try to test if I can pass the Turing test. And see if I could actually talk to myself, and or someone could talk to it and think it's me, but it's just my clone. I do that every week. I, everyone has their hobbies. <laughs> uh, hobbies. I mean, I I speak with someone called Sebastian every week. I have no way oh, of oh, uh, of oh, knowing okay. if that is really you. Um, it is true they have no way, but um, um, maybe I may have mentioned this to you before, but I'll, I'll mention it to you now. Next time you see me in person, check on the back of my neck and I won't show you now if there's a number. <laughs> yes, the number yes. is my clone serial number. I think I mentioned this to you. You mentioned uh, the, it. The, the latest clone is 393. Anyway, uh, we're digressing now. Let's get back on point. <laughs> Motion is disappearing content is one of the only ways to ensure privacy, is inevitable to ensure privacy. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. So we took a step at defining things. I learned we need to define things first. So what are we talking about? Uh, you gave a couple of examples. Content is a pretty broad term and it deserves a little bit of precision, but uh, also we don't want to restrict ourselves. So when we speak of content, we mainly mean things that are published on the internet and publicly available to some degree. Doesn't mean everybody has access to it, but a sizable number of people has access to it. The number of people needs to be large enough so we lose control over that content, right? So this is articles, videos, podcasts, pictures, recordings of any kind uh, that may be in scope for that. And maybe not so much the personal pictures that you store on your personal cloud account, for instance. This is not the kind of content we are talking about. Uh, it's an important distinction because we're not talking about everything online, but actually about things that got published for broader audiences to see. And to be blunt, not the disappearance of content ensures privacy, not posting it in the first place does ensure privacy. That's an important distinction. My main point, content does not disappear. So we can demand it, we can say it's crucial, but actually it never does. It is either transformed or stored out of sight or not linked to it anymore, like in the case of the right to be forgotten, that we are not allowed to, to find it in indices anymore, uh, in, a, in a search engine anymore. But in our current internet architecture, there is no way to get the toothpaste back into the tube. I'm sorry. Thousands of services index every piece of information we share. Every service we use is analyzing us. It is simply not realistic to demand any form of disappearing content, even though there is an illusion in some services that, that this may be the case. But even if things disappear from Instagram or Snapchat, the meta information and often the information itself actually stays very real, safe and stored away in the servers of these service providers. 
And uh, well, uh, while we add it, the larger threat to privacy actually is that invisible data that is being collected without our, your knowledge, not necessarily the content you publish. Next up, Sebastian. Let's hear his argument. Every bit of information that is stored or shared is potentially exposing you to a privacy breach. So indeed, as you said, the only way to ensure privacy is by not sharing anything at all. But if we assume that we're talking about sharing, creating content, uh, the only way to ensure it is that, uh, that you have privacy that becomes ultimately deleted. Which is interesting because another side point is the content that is often created anyway is mostly meaningless. That's another debate. Uh, so there would be really no point in storing it. And even if it were not meaningless, in the grand scheme of things, it will be destroyed anyway. When I say the grand scheme is what will the internet look like in a few centuries anyway? There's one important aspect I want to come back to is that I believe most of the internet users today are not capable of handling their privacy well enough. They don't understand. We don't understand sharing settings well enough. They can be explained multiple times. We still don't get it. So it feels that by being forced in some apps and some websites for these messages, for this content to be self-destructing is actually the only way to ensure that we don't have to educate people too much because it's just a nice wish to hope that they will understand. You could say there are, there are all the other alternatives uh, to protect privacy. You could talk about encryption, but encryption, unfortunately, is not reliable. I was just reading an article, uh, an article unrelated, but it made me think of it as I was preparing for this debate. Quantum computers will eventually break all forms of encryption that exist today. So all your messages, if they were not uh, destroyed, will be potentially, even if encrypted today, will be decrypted in the years and decades to come. And guess, by the way, which country is one of the leaders today in terms of quantum computing? computing? It's China. Uh, so I can just let you imagine what would happen if the Chinese government has access to some of your old messages which are encrypted and you thought that was a reliable way to ensure privacy. I'll conclude with one thing. The good indication that this privacy works with self-destructing messages, government officials use it to the point that open government advocates are worried that they are being misused, these uh, self-destructing messages, by public officials to conduct, con to conduct business in secret and avoid transparency laws. That's, for me, a very good example as to why disappearing content is one of the best and only ways today to ensure privacy. And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his rebuttal. I encourage you to Google or Bing or whatever you use to search the web um, to search for quantum safe cryptography. Turns out there's a whole whole branch of cryptographic methods that will be in place when we will have quantum computers that break today's algorithms. That's that's true. That's right. But that happened in the past as well. So today's computer broke the algorithms of the past. Uh, I'm not very worried about that. And yes, indeed, cryptography is a way to ensure privacy to some extent, not the full extent. Um, there are other ways that I can think of. For instance, you can separate the content being posted from the personal information. Uh, not for every piece of content given. If your picture is uh, posted, it's hard to remove your identity information from that picture. Okay, fair. Um, but to some degree, an another option is uh, to control access rights. So you have you have uh, content published, but you control who is able to access and uh, control it. Very much like you can right now pro protect your privacy and the safety of your home by closing the door and the windows. Uh, same here. You demanding something that's just not realistic to demand and not working. Even in those apps that quote unquote destroy the content, they are not destroying the content. And while they are uh, uh, faking to destroy the content, everybody on the internet uh, who had access can actually make a copy of that before. And that happened in plenty of times. So people take screenshots, uh, people uh, have backup copies. The service provider uh, itself uh, usually has backup uh, copies in many, many cases, depending on what service we talk about and what kind of self-destruction you envision. But the truth of the matter is information is not destructing itself. That sounds pretty cool. It's just not how the internet is built. 
Now you can say maybe the internet should build that way. I'm not so sure about that either because there's also something to be said about uh, being um, responsible for what you do online, being responsible for what you post and publish and being held accountable if these things uh, are are maybe, um, um, well, something you much rather remove afterwards. Very much like if you walk out there and say something in public, you have no right that people all of a sudden forget what you said. Uh, the same is true on the internet. If you publish something openly, yeah, you may be lucky and people forget what you posted, but there is no such thing as a self-destroying uh, information and there's no right to do so. It even can be seen as a threat to free speech and threat to uh, uh, freedom rights because the question is, who is in charge of removing and self-destroying content that you want to see removed from the internet? Um, or a, co a content that you want to see removed from messaging services. Who is it that is, is doing that destroying? And how do you guarantee that it really happens? So I do think it's a, it's a nice story. It's a fairy tale we like to, uh, telling ourselves. It's technically unrealistic. It's not solving for the actual problem that people post stuff without understanding the consequences. And I think we have some growing up to do to learn consequences of actions. And ask ourselves what we mean when we say uh, we want to protect privacy because the meaning of the word privacy is something that's unclear as well and now on to sebastian so you mentioned at the beginning uh, of your arguments that people can use access rights to change how other people can access their content now let me ask our listeners that question how often did it happen to you when you thought you had shared some content, let's say on YouTube, let's say your document, and there was confusion on the other end with the people you were sharing with as to why they could not access it, or sometimes that they could access it when they were not supposed to access it. And it's not a bug. It's not a problem with the, the app you were using. It's only because you very often, and I, this happens to me as well, uh, we are making mistakes in how we use these sharing settings. Sometimes we don't even understand the concept of, oh, it's public or it's unlisted or it's private or privately shared. And even though once you explain it, it's actually not very complicated. It's not rocket science. There is confusion. And I think it is a nice wish, unfortunately, for people to understand how sharing works. And you said we would need to define privacy. Let me offer one uh, cynical definition of privacy. As you were uh, saying that, I, I was thinking about it. And I think privacy is the hope. Unfortunately, it's only the hope that most of what we share uh, will remain private to the extent that we want it to be private with friends or a certain fraction of the people that we share it with. Uh, I think it's the hope. It's not the actual privacy because we can never be sure. You are right. And the motion today is about trying to find the maybe the inevitable, the best way or the only way to ensure as much privacy as possible, to have as much hope that this information remains confidential uh, slash private. Yes, a copy can be made. Sometimes you can take a, a photo uh, of whatever is on your screen. Uh, we're not even talking about screenshots because screenshots can be prevented if you really want to, right? If the app is probably well designed you can prevent screenshots but then we're just pushing the problem away indeed taking a photo with a camera but you can make it difficult right my point here is what other way exists right encryption i don't think is the most reliable way or you can combine it but indeed the self-destructive mechanism is the best hope we have here you talked about accountability i want to get back on this i don't think it removes anything about people being accountable for anything that they do uh, you're held accountable uh, even if the message was destructed, and in fact, to your point, if that message was not properly destructed, uh, sorry, if that message was not properly destroyed, then yes, you will. there will be proof and evidence and you'll be liable in court. But here's the thing, as I mentioned earlier, government officials are using these self-destructing messaging apps um, for a reason. It's because they know, or they hope at least, that that uh, this their messaging will remain private, which is a problem, as I mentioned, from an ethics perspective and open government, but this is not what we're debating uh, today about. So yes, I, I agree with you. There's no guarantee that the destroying actually happened, but it's better than nothing. We have be nothing better 
to ensure privacy or that hope of privacy. It may sound very cynical, uh, but that's why I think disappearing messages is uh, inevitable to ensure as much privacy as possible. Final statements. Dirk goes first. The dominant threats to privacy are not coming from content pieces that are not disappearing. The dominant threats to privacy come from companies that overstep boundaries, come from state officials that use data they can gather and harvest to uh, basically follow you around. And those, those threats to privacy are much more threatening and much more real than you posting a picture you, you rather not post. I don't think that disappearing content changes anything about the threats to privacy. I think disappearing content is merely cosmetics. It hides away the fact that the real privacy concern lays deeper than that. And to your point, government officials try to delete the content they put out after the fact and they keep failing on that because uh, the, for every for every Twitter account that's spun up, there is some service mirroring every tweet that shows up. And even if you delete it after the fact, that makes a nice news story to tell everybody that you just deleted the tweet you rather would have seen not posted at all. And the same is true for the pictures you share on Instagram, for the material you put in your Facebook account, for the stuff that you have in your Snapchat there are plenty of people that have everything they need to invade your privacy from the fact that you posted it in the first place. So if you're really concerned about protecting your privacy, then don't post it. Or post only things, to take that common phrase, post only things that you feel comfortable with appearing on the front page of the New York Times in the business context and maybe in a conversation between friends if you're in a personal uh, setting. I do think it's a uh, it's not working. It's not existing, it's not realistic, and it's not the only way to protect privacy anyway. Sebastian. Human beings are social animals. They need to share. There's no way you can ask people to stop sharing so that they have privacy. It's just not going to work. We're mammals, we share. We need to do this and we don't want to worry about privacy. The problem is we do not understand privacy. We are not Germans, all of us. We struggle with notions of private data. Uh, and I say Germans because of the history and, and the sensitivity of, of data, right? So you have in particular, and I'm not a, this is not an attack, it's a praise. You have a particularly good understanding of the privacy concepts, uh, and, and in Europe, we have GDPR and other things like this, which are difficult to understand for most people. That's what I want to stress. We don't have that education. And people don't want to think about this. This is why Snapchat is so popular in the first place. Teenagers, younger generations just want to share, but they don't want to worry about what is going to be exposed. Yes, they are still accountable. They may not realize this, but that changes nothing to the point that we have no better way than self-destructing messages or content to protect as much privacy as possible. And government officials, for better and most often for worse, for bad reasons, use that precisely for that reason, because they know they will not be caught, or they think they won't be caught. Uh, but to, to date, that's what is happening. You don't get caught if you use self-destructing messages on popular uh, platforms and apps. So yes, uh, self-destructing messages are the only way one of the best ways or one of the only ways to ensure privacy. Sorry about the German thing. It's not an attack, seriously. I, I, it's actually, I sincerely think Germans and Europeans by extension, but Germans in particular, um, or the educated ones, at least have a good understanding of privacy. And they're very sensitive to what is being stored about them and, and that kind of aspect. No? Don't you think? Um, so first off, it didn't feel like an attack. I, I don't know. I do think um, Germany plays a, a front role in all these privacy discussions, but many German citizens take it as granted and don't reflect over it. So I would say we are just the same as everybody else, but for plenty of reasons, the people in power and the people reflective enough and the intelligentsia are sensitive to privacy and probably more so than in other countries. And that's, as you say, I said, it's 
it's a a learning that is still alive from uh, from Second World War and Nazi regime and everything. So, um, but if you go ahead, and as far as Europe goes, I think this is the same legacy, right? So, having GDPR in place and uh, the privacy regulations we have is a learning from times when we were too free sh freely sharing to to use your words. I think the main the main part the part where I have a bit of a problem with is I don't think that there is such a thing like a self destructing message really. <laughs> I do think the whole thing is uh, just designed to calm you down and uh, attract users with a uh, fake privacy. An illusion. It's an illusion, and that's an illusion of privacy. And that's mm. and that's what what sh makes me shy away from the idea that we need this to ensure privacy. No, we actually need companies that that literally want to leave us alone so uh, the the right to be left alone the right to be not followed around the right to be not analyzed in every step that you do the right to have for instance a communication channel that's truly just between the the communication partners these are things that are technically possible but that we you don't need a self-destructing message i just need a guarantee that, that we that my communication with you cannot be shared outside of this uh, this conversation I don't disagree with you. I think it's I think it's a question of realism of what can realistically happen. We could put all the technology in place; it exists, as you said, in theory. But who's going to fund it? Yeah. Uh, and if and, and if you finally you want to keep it free, well, you're going to lose out on on the data or something. And no one has on the an incentive to that, actually. Especially the privacy piece is a tricky one because even in Europe, even the German government, no government on this planet has an incentive to guarantee your real privacy. They all have an incentive to have some access to the important parts of the, your sharing. They don't care about uh, the, your picture specifically. They care about who is showing up on that picture, where was it taken, and when did you send it to whom. And this is information that never goes away, no matter what you do with that picture. And so uh, we, we have, we have created a the point. monster. Yeah. We created the system that, uh, with all the wrong incentives. And in fact, I did not have a good, uh, you had a very good argument about the metadata aspect. I had completely ignored that aspect. In fact, because I did not have a way to counter argue, I just ignored it in, in my, in my piece, because it's true. Now you can tell Actually, me if you, want, you want me to leave that in, in the, <laughs> you can leave it if you want, because it was a very valid argument. You know, as long as you, if you, even if you destroy the content, it is one actually small part of the entire equation. Uh, to your point, if you have the metadata, you're still you're still in pretty much big trouble, like of of getting identified of who you are and your habits. And it has been demonstrated over and over uh, in multiple studies that indeed metadata is enough to know a lot about you. Yeah. So the actual content is almost not important. Um, it's true. Yeah, I there's nothing I can say about this. I I, I guess I, I try to focus my argument on on the fact that even if it's an illusion, it's a, or partly an illusion it's just better than nothing or better than anything else that's that was the the, the stance i was trying to have yeah um to be frank uh, you know personally i don't use any of the self-destructive uh messaging not because i i care or don't care about privacy it's just it, it as i explained before uh, we started recording it it uh it bothers me to just to have like my messages and my content just de be deleted forever. Like what was what was almost the point in creating it in the first place? Probably that's the reason why we get along so well. I'm practically on the other end of the spectrum. I delete messages in such high frequency, and I oh, don't wow. keep an archive of emails, and I never missed it. Oh wow, interesting. And the, the only thing I, that I keep I was... is my pictures and my podcasts because those are those are recordings I can. Uh, a, a picture that has been taken is uh, if if that is lost then it's gone right um but uh, um i those are the only things where i keep an archive on but uh, mm -hmm. emails texts uh whatever i i keep and even even pictures i'm pretty drastic when i when i sort through them before i store them interesting away. yeah what about uh before the internet handwritten letters do you keep them or do you do you throw them away? I'm not sure. Personal if I, ones, not bank statements. Yeah, 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 I'm not sure if I have any left. I do think I have a few okay. letters out of sentimental reasons, like uh, handwriting of yeah. my mom, or um, I do think I have a stack of love letters somewhere, teenager uh, love letters. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's a very small number of things, um, and I wouldn't you, even if if I would 
be pressed to. Um, I threw away plenty of things from my past, so I don't keep okay. a large stack of stuff. So. Interesting. No, it's yeah, it's true that I mean, really at the opposite angle, uh, spectrum end of the spectrum here. I was I was mortified when I lost a hard hard uh, disk drive in in the early two thousands because it had all my Outlook uh, backup archive from my personal messages before I switched to Gmail, which launched in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. And it bothered me. I just lost everything. And it was indeed like, it was a few, maybe 100 or 1,000 messages back then only. But I don't know. It's, it's as if I'm keeping this also to reflect upon my old self or my younger self, rather. And and maybe with, I, I'm not hoping for it, but it's true that now that we're talking a lot about machine learning, I'm actually wondering beyond what I was talking about, a clone or a chatbot, even to see if there is any pattern that could be analyzed or detected, maybe even things like mental illness. I don't know. Like maybe we will find out by the way you express yourself and you miss out on words that you have sleep disorder, which maybe I have because I don't sleep very well, for instance. And maybe by connecting this with the time of at which I was sending emails and my location in terms of time zone back then could actually draw some interesting data. So it, it's for all these reasons. And for me, I treat my words just my written word and my, my I guess my my verbal recording with you to the same level as pictures. Right? I, I, it's things that I create that come out of me, right? That I cannot recreate in the future in the exact same phrasing, maybe. Mm. So that's why it matters to me. I agree with you. Like I actually delete emails which are purely purely practical, like a one liner saying, "Hey, are we meeting at nine thirty? Right, this one I actually go to the extent of going to the sent emails and delete it right right away. Yeah. Right? It's it's weird, but everything else I do keep. I mean, the the yeah. interesting thing about all this, uh, what we discuss here, because you also suggested encryption as a potential way to protect privacy. I do think yeah. there's a misconception about what it is actually that we try to protect, and that was goes to the discussion mm -hmm. you, we had uh, just now about metadata as well. And the comparison I said, uh, um, um, and the, the comparison I once heard is uh, privacy. If you want to find a real world example for what is privacy, then take the bathroom. If you go into the bathroom and you close the door behind you, that's not because it's a secret what you're doing in there. It's because you want to have your privacy. Everybody knows what you're going to do. Well, in most cases, every, people will know what you're doing there. If it smells like weed outside, then people also know what you're doing in there. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a secret. So encryption is not solving for the real problem. And the, right, there's confidentiality versus secrecy. Yeah, exactly. Right? This is where we're moving in, in different waters, I see. Yeah. Uh, and people point. confuse one with the other. So when people say, uh, for instance, when you say um, NSA surveilling uh, people is a problem, internet, uh, everybody analyzing uh, movement is a problem, and then people often reply, uh, oh, I have nothing to hide. This is... For yeah. that very yeah. reason, you also have nothing to hide if you go to the bathroom. It's uh, but uh, you still close the door because you don't want to be watched while you're in the bathroom, and that's the same notion in the end. Uh, it's just for us so hard to grasp because the internet is such an alien beast and such a young young thing for us. But it's the same kind of concept in in the end. All right, as usual, let us know what you thought about our arguments. You can vote on todebate.eu. Thumbs up, thumbs down if you're in favor or against the motion. But do vote after you listen to this, not before. Thank you for listening. Let us know over email on the website what you thought about this debate. You can vote on the website. You can vote on the website to debate.eu. Thumbs up, thumbs down, whether you were convinced for or against the motion. Anything else to add? Some final few final few self-destructing <laughs> words yeah so Dirk. so we are here to stay so our podcast is not self-destructing thankfully yeah i do like to add that we have a newsletter so maybe our listeners don't know uh where we send out a news mail whenever we release a new episode sometimes with additional links pointers to other podcasts that may have interesting side content sometimes only witty thoughts and weird jokes and animated gifs and what have you so it's maximum one newsletter per episode. We don't sell anything. It's just us having fun. So if you're curious and interested, sign up at todebate.eu slash newsletter. That's todebate.eu slash newsletter. And I think I, I knew uh, listeners should know that from now on, I'll probably be the one preparing the newsletter because you used to do that every every week or so. 
uh, which means they, you listeners, our dear listeners, you have to get used to weird jokes. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, intelligent additional research and content. That was mostly Dirk doing it, but with me, it's mostly weird jokes. So if you want a weird French, uh, weird jokes from a Frenchman, sign up. I'm a fan, so we'll be others. <laughs> and uh, every once in a while, we will flip and uh, share the the writing task. Uh, so some German links in structure will happen to spill into the newsletter every once in a while. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thank you for listening, everyone. And stay tuned for our next episode in just a week. Bye. Bye-bye. Do you not create? Do you not create a, a short link to debate.eu slash mailing list I, slash newsletter slash newsletter? Slash, I think uh, we need your love <laughs> slash <laughs> slash. If you want a short link slash we need a, we need your love. Let me let me um, restart. Yeah, so many short that, links. So you don't remember now. Um, you need a short link to a, 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 an index of all the short links. <laughs> I, to debate.eu slash index you will have all the short links 